Well, good evening. Um, let me put some slides up here real quickly. Uh, let's do this. Oops. So I am, oh, you know what? I have my, uh, I have, I don't know if you know this, Paul, but you can have PowerPoint do um, closed captioning for you automatically. And I have it set for my lecture, so it's just doing that now. So cool. let me just share the screen real quick. Okay. And we will do this. There we go. There we go. All right. How's Perfect. that? Now you're going to be controlling the uh, presentation, so. I'll control the slides. Yeah, and you and Thank I will go back and forth with the uh, with the yep. actual talk itself. Perfect. All right. So, um, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where and which time zone you're in. Um, it's it's great to have everybody online now. This is being recorded, uh, and I'm sure that we'll be posting the recording of the uh, presentation, the webinar, um, on some FJMC accessible site. Uh, what I thought uh, that Paul and I would do is do a, a couple of quick introductions, talk about a few Zoom ground rules, and then the overview of the presentation is going to be discussions of stress and stress how it relates to, to COVID-19 and the current quarantine. Uh, and then we'll talk about some coping strategies. And then um, as Paul and I mentioned, uh, the best part is the discussion. We'll um, open the floor for any questions or comments or discussion that folks have. Uh, Paul, why don't you introduce yourself first, since you're at the top left of my screen, then I'll go and then we'll go around and have other people talk about this. All right. So hi, I'm uh, Paul Davidson. I'm a clinical psychologist in Boston. I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I've been very actively involved with FJMC for many years and have held local and national posts. Um, I've been doing a lot of work now, all remotely. Uh, with all the patients that I see talking about coronavirus and stress issues and uh, just thrilled to be able to participate with all of you tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. So um, my name is Gary Cates. I'm trying to adjust the lighting in my office and it's not exactly optimal. I think that's probably the best I'm going to get. Anyway, I am um, also like my very dear friend and colleague, Paul Davidson. I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist here in, in, in California. I am an associate professor of psychology at Cal State Northridge, and I teach classes in uh, adult and child psychopathology. And um, I also have a uh, private practice in Thousand Oaks, and I've been seeing, I don't know if you have Paul as well, uh, a, a sharp uptick in people coming in with concerns about how they're coping with this. Um, and all- Only 100%. I'm doing it by Zoom. Everything, yeah, everybody, so, um, everybody, I, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, um, when, when Paul and I discussed uh, putting on this, this talk, I was, I was very excited. I always like working with Paul, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a, a very lively hour. Um, ben, why don't you give us a quick, oh, uh, before I go to Ben, so as far as my FJMC connection, I'm currently the Western Region President, and I've been involved in um, a number of different FJMC um, uh, not much of uh, programs, uh, initiatives over the past uh, several years, including during Men's Voices and the, the um, Health and Wellness Initiative. Ben Aminia, let's go to you next. I'm Ben Aminia, I'm the Western Region Chaplain for currently. All right, and Alex. Alan Budman, Vice President for Training. And Alex Romano. Um, Alex Romano, Western Region, and uh, my wife Linda is here with us, um, and we're both uh, longtime care of consultants. Indeed. Norwin. Uh, good evening, good afternoon. I'm Norwin Marins, an independent marketing and communications professional and involved in FJMC since about 2003, uh, past uh, president of the Midwest Region for the years 2015 through the 17 through 17 and continue to be involved. Nice. Steve Mandel. Well, I'm a neurologist in New York and as you might have seen on 60 Minutes, we're at the epicenter. Uh, my colleagues are on the front line I'm doing telehealth and also um, doing my best to stay alive. Yeah, that's a very tough place to be. Uh, Ezra. 
Let me unmute you, Ezra. Oh, oh there we go. You. Thank you. Pardon me. Hi there, um, Ezra Rich. I um, met some of you at, at LDI this year. I'm a member of the uh, resurging uh, chapter here in Buffalo. Um, nice. I do a, a marketing for local commercial real estate firm uh, locally. Wonderful. Uh, we have Al, Al, Alan Jacobs. I don't know if he's online. Oh, there. Uh, so a little bit of lag there. I, I recognize Alan Jacobs' um, background from our FJMC Western Region meetings. So we'll Alan. Oh, there hey, you are. Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm well, past president of Men's Club at Temple Aliyah, and I'm, I'm also the uh, programming uh, VP for the FJMC currently. And this was really interesting to me, and I shared this link with several other people. I'm hoping they're going to jump on and join us. Wonderful. Uh, Jack Harrison, you want to talk about yourself for a bit? Uh, we'll pass. Uh, Monica, an introduction for you. All right, then let's just go. Let's just go ahead at that at this point. So, a couple of quick Zoom ground rules. Um, if uh, if you can, please put your mics on mute. Um, I don't. I'm not the host of the meeting, so I can't do that. So I'm going to rely on you guys to do that. If you want to ask a question or you want to um, make a point or or ask either Paul or me. Anything while the presentation is going on, I'm fine taking questions as they come up. Um, with your with your mic on mute, if you're on a computer, if you hold the space bar down, it works as a push to talk. And then so as long as you're holding the space bar down, you can talk. And when you let go of the space bar, it goes back to mute. And that's probably the easiest way to do it if you're on a computer. I don't know if there's a similar push to talk function on tablets or phones. Uh, but please do keep your phones on mute and you can unmute yourself one way or another as we go on. Um, I, like I said, Paul, I have, I'm happy taking questions at any point uh, and I'm sure uh, Paul will as well. Absolutely. Okay, so moving on. Let's talk about, uh, we had a chance before the meeting formally started. Paul I, I did a wonderful job of connecting with everybody online and sort of asking how folks are doing. It's a good practice to get into in general. I think we can, uh, that is one of our later slides that Paul and I have, we'll, we'll talk about that connecting to other people. So keep doing that is, is a good thing. My, um, my job uh, for the beginning part of this presentation is to talk about what stress is and what it does to people. Um, what I have up here on the current slide are three definitions from researchers that uh, folks who do research in the area of stress are about. Stress is the not unspecific response of the body. It's a physical response of the body to any demand made upon it. Other folks think look at stress as um, our, our response to social readjustments. And the pandemic that we're currently experiencing now is probably one great example of that. And a third definition of stress is a situation that, that someone regards as threatening and is possibly exceeding his or her resources. So stress is something that is put upon us. It's generally something that is, is not necessarily chosen voluntarily. And our body physically responds to it, um, not only in terms of physical response, but also psychological responses as well. One of the ways in which we, we can conceptualize stress as, is that it, it when a stressor impacts us, like the pandemic, like the quarantine, like not like the the 24-hour news cycle and stuff that's going on there, one of the things that we that folks happen is they tend to respond in certain stepwise manners. In early stages of stress, is what we call the alarm phase. It's a brief period of high arousal. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? There's a burst of psychophysiologic response. There's two parts of our nervous system that respond. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system kind of activates us and orients us to something that could be threatening. And the parasympathetic nervous system eventually sort of tries to calm things down. After that initial alarm period, most folks go into a resistance period. We have this sustained level of increased arousal where we're always kind of on guard. One of the things we see there is increased metabolism. Uh, so you'll, you'll be tired. Uh, you might fatigue, you might be more irritable than, than the usual. And we also know from studies in uh, uh, of physiology that cortisol, a stress hormone, is, is, tends to be excreted continuously through, this, through the resistance phase as well. After that, we tend to hit the exhaustion phase. 
In the exhaustion phase, uh, we see all of the physiological effects of the chronic stress impacting us, including our immune system begins to function uh, less well uh, as our body shifts more towards sort of maintaining life functions and away from immune, immune system functioning. I realized just now, Paul, that I forgot to ask if you had comments about the prior two slides. Let me just pause here and see if there's anything you want to add. Just to, to say that the stress response is really an evolutionary response has been very helpful throughout the time that we have been on the planet. It's that fight or flight that allowed us to, uh, you know, escape when we were being chased down by a mastodon or, you know, we were being attacked by a rival group. What we see now is that we're not, we're not being faced with the same kind of dangers, but we have other stressors typically in our life that can elicit the exact same response. It may be having to pay a bill. It may be a deadline for a piece of work. It may be a situation as we're experiencing now where there is this threat of great danger to all of us. And we have to be on, uh, you know, kind of high alert. And ideally, what it does, it, it allows us to function a little bit better to respond to that immediate stress. But when it is prolonged, as Gary was talking about, it can create a number of both physiological and emotional issues to the body. And we're gonna talk about that uh, through the rest of the presentation. All right. Um, so one of the things that when we look at the research in stress and coping, I talked before about something that causes stress is social readjustment is one definition of stress. One of the most, for those in research, one of the most um, highly cited non-published works is the Holmes and Reihe Social Readjustment Scale. And I've got a couple of bits of data from that scale uh, excerpted here in this slide. So on a, on a zero to 100 scale, what is the, what are stressful events and what are the ratings of them? These two researchers did this. This is over 50 years old now, but death 1930s. Of the what? 19? Yeah, yeah. 1930. Death 90 the years old. Is in the is 100. That's the most stressful thing back in the 30s, 60s. People were talking about divorce, marital separation. You see all the way down to like vacation is a 13. Minor legal infraction is 11. But if the question is well, where does global band pandemic fall and <laughs> quarantine? I mean, we we know stress, we know certain things, but this is this is brand new territory for researchers and clinicians in the area of stress, uh, because this is the this is the first time that we've had this sophistication of science around at the same time that the entire planet is being in, in, engulfed, if you will, by this rather stressful um, act. Um, Paul, anything you want to add to this? Just with the scale, one of the things that was very interesting that Holmes and Wright found was that we were familiar with distress, such as the, the death of the spouse, divorce, marital separation. They also found that eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -S -S, or good stress, has almost the exact same effect. So marriage is yeah. often as <laughs> stressful as divorce might be. Um, having a child is very similar to losing a child, you know, getting a new job. It's like losing a job. So um, many of the things that we're going to talk about apply to the stress that people might have, even when something is going well. There are still stressors attached to that. We need to adapt to that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. So now that we know a little bit about what stress is and what causes stress and how we study stress, let's talk about how we can cope. Um, Paul, do you want to lead, lead on this slide? Yeah. And I'll, I'll chime yeah. in later on. So in terms of dealing with stress, I think one of the most helpful things we can all focus on is figure out what really is in our control and what is out of our control. And the goal is to focus as much of your effort, as much of your energy as possible on what is still within your control. For example, with coronavirus, we have no control over what the, the global spread is going to look like or what it's going to be like in your neighborhood. The only thing that we can control is the likelihood of our getting it based on our following all the dictives that we're being told we should do, uh, including you know, social distancing, which is a term all psychologists hate. I think physical distance is reasonable. We want social connectedness. That's what's really important to us. Um, the notion of 
wiping things down with this, something that's sanitized, wearing gloves, you know, uh, like disposable gloves, you know, the, the most recent recommendations are starting to suggest that we should be wearing surgical masks as well outdoors. For a long time though, people were saying only those who are ill should be wearing it. Those are things we can control. We can wash our food when we get it in. And as long as we are focused on what we actually can control, that keeps our emotions in check as well. And that helps to keep stress and anxiety under control. Where we tend to lose it and where anxiety comes in is when we start to fear something that's likely to happen or we think might happen in the future that we may not be able to control at all. So some of the typical things that we suggest that help you stay in control are creating and following a schedule. Now, this may be a bit more challenging for those of us who are working remotely, especially if you have never done this before. I know for me, I never dreamt I was gonna be working at home because I work at Brigham Women's Hospital. I you know, work in a clinic. I do private practice as well, but I'm always out seeing patients. So this is radically different. And in order to do well, it's a wise idea to try to create some kind of a schedule. So getting up at a more specific time, uh, allowing some time, you know, one of the things I say is exercise where possible. When we create stress hormones, especially cortisol, as Gary mentioned, it builds up in the bloodstream and it becomes a bit of an irritant. And one of the, you know, we, again, it was there for fight or flight. And if we are not fighting something and we are not running away, it kind of builds up in our system and that leads to this feeling of distress. Uh, one of the ways we can help dissipate it is through exercise. So maybe in your daily schedule, you find a, a bit of time to exercise. We recommend at least 30 minutes a day. And as I tell people, you don't have to do 30 minutes at once. You can do, you know, three bouts of 10 minutes. So 10 minutes in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, 10 in the evening. It can do 15 and 15, 30 or more is even better. Um, so, you know, try to schedule that in. If you've got work you need to do, try to create specific times in which you're going to do your work. Um, you know, attitude is something we actually have a lot of control over. And trying to limit negative thoughts, we're gonna come back to this in a moment, but we can let our thoughts run away from us. And you know, one of the coping strategies we'll talk about later is kind of limiting how much time you're devoting to the constant stream of information that's bombarding us um, and try to focus on the positive. So um, I was looking at uh, something that Tony Robbins had point, put out. I don't usually read him, but he came across my stream. So I just took a quick look at it and he said, you know, there's this notion of uh, us thinking about this quarantine and how challenging it is. It's like another way to do that is to reframe it. And we talk about reframing responses. Say, hey, this is a wonderful opportunity to be with those who are closest to me for a, you know, an extended period of time, something for whom many of us have never had the opportunity in our entire lifetimes. Um, I should <laughs> mention that um, I'm not positive this is true or not, but what I've told is that there are a, a record number of filings for divorce in the month of May in China. So <laughs> for those people who've been together 24-7 for a couple of months now, uh, we're starting to see the cracks in the foundation for the weak relationship. We can reframe things, you know, and say, hey, this is a, you know, and I'll talk about this later, this is a unique opportunity for us to achieve many, many things and for us to pick up skills and so on. Even this, this is a whole new series for FJMC. We're starting to utilize you know, uh, online video meetings as a way to communicate, as a way to teach. So there are good things that are gonna come from this. Uh, and I'm hoping that for many of you, you will look at other opportunities in your home and by reframing into, hey, this is this great opportunity to be with those who I care about the most and stay connected with those in my life. It's going to be much better. Gary, what do you want to say about that? I'll, I'll say the other thing I'll add is what I've been telling my patients with regard to exercise, 30 minutes a day, uh, the intensity of the exercise should be at a point where it's difficult to have this kind of conversation usually. And when you have that level of intensity of exercise, it has remarkable anti-stress, anti-anxiety, and anti-depressant effects as well. Correct. Um, that's the only thing, uh, no. Great, perfect. Next slide. Yeah. Um, you go this. 
I'll start with this one, then we'll go back to you. So with like, just like there are different stages of coping, there are different types of coping as well. And what I put on this slide are two purposefully bipolar ends, if you will, of different types of coping. Most folks, as I say in the third bullet point, most folks here fall somewhere between the two. But in general, there are two styles of coping that folks have. Some folks are information seekers. So for them, knowledge is power. For them, I wanna find out as much information as I possibly can, because the more I know, the more I possibly can control. The more I know, the more I can sort of predict or anticipate, and that goes into this notion of having that schedule and making things predictable and expect, expecting. And the other folks really don't wanna deal with this. Other folks uh, are much better off when they're distracted when uh because gathering more information just gives them more to worry about knowing more about what's going on and what potentially could happen when these um probabilities or possibilities turn into certainties for folks that get very anxious they they're better off finding ways of passing their time that are productive and not destructive um of course these are extremes i mean there's some people that have the news be on you know 24 7 and they're watching television and and the news cycle can go 24 seven now as well, and that gets very disruptive. Uh, and then there are some folks that are a little more Pollyannish and really need to know a little bit more, uh, despite their attempts at, at distracting. So just keep this in mind, um, Paul is saying, we think about this as an opportunity to spend time with loved ones that we might not have had in the past. Um, not everyone has the same style of coping that their spouse or loved ones do. So this can obviously become an issue if, if your spouse wants CNN on 24 seven and you just wanna go for a walk. Um, so knowing that there are differences in how people cope um, is, is, is some, one way in which I think you could help uh, not follow what the Chinese possibly are doing in May. Paul, anything you wanna to add to that? No, that's good, sounds good. Okay. Um, all you, Paul, go ahead. Okay, so I think one of the things that we want to think about here is to recognize the different parts of uh, our internalized world. So this is thoughts, feelings, and emotion. And you know, I, in order to cope with stress in general, it's important to first recognize what your thoughts are. You know, if, if somebody you know, has a problem with alcohol abuse, they're unlikely to get better until they recognize and say, yes, I am an alcoholic. So you have to acknowledge the thoughts that you have in the very beginning. And a lot of people tend to fight those thoughts and say, oh, I shouldn't be upset about this. I shouldn't feel this way. It's like, you know what? We encourage people to accept what you are feeling. Rather than to fight it, you use up a lot of psychic energy trying to fight these things and realize these are probably fairly rational responses to a very unusual situation. And it's important to figure out what does make sense and what doesn't make sense. It's not to say everything is rational, but it's completely normal to feel sad and upset and stressed and scared, worried whether it's for yourself or for others. You know, right now we have a situation where we moved my parents to assisted living about six weeks ago. And in the state of Massachusetts, and should be probably lots of parts of the country, all nursing facilities, all assisted living are closed to any visitation. So um, this has been challenging because we can't even see them. Uh, but so I know it's rational to feel stressed about that. So again, I stop and think, of, well, if I can accept that, then I can be much more productive. If I can accept, if I recognize my thoughts and I can accept my feelings, it's going to make it much more easy for me to have emotions that allow me to be much more productive. So what I did on Friday was I did uh, deliver things to the facility where they are, and I figured out where their room was, and I waited outside, and I called them, and I said, look out your window. And sure enough, they could see me. And, you know, simple things like that, you know, make a bit of a difference at a time like this. In order to stay focused and not let things get out of control, we really do encourage people to try to set some limits on how much time you're spending watching TV. I said just enough news to feel informed, but not so much that you're going to feel overwhelmed. Now, Gary was describing my wife Susan and I's situation exactly. 
She could have the news on 24 seven and I just want to go for a walk. It's really our life. Um, I, you know, whatever's out there comes to me in my feed on my phone anyways. I know what's going on. I'll put the news on for a little bit, but it's like, I've got too many other things to do because listening to that is only going to get you stressed. And I think of individuals for whom, you know, after 9-11, they saw images of the planes going into the Twin Towers over and over and over and over again. And after a while, you develop this secondary trauma, you know, that uh, from just seeing it again, and again, and again, I fear that there are many people who might be, you know, experiencing something similar from, uh, you know, COVID-19. And so we have to try to set some limits on that again, recognize what the thoughts are, you need to, and you, hopefully you have somebody you can share some of those with, which is always a good idea. Accept them, figure what's rational, and then start thinking about how can I start to be more pragmatic about this. Gary, what would you like to say? The only thing I was gonna add to that accepting of feelings is, is this notion that these are very strange times, right? So it's at some level, as you were saying, is we wanna, we wanna normalize this, that it's, it is okay. Right, this is very bizarre. And and when your spouse says, "I'm worried about what's about my parents getting ill, I'm worried about me getting ill, I'm worried about you getting ill," that's that's a normal worry to have. But as we talked about before, you can't sustain that level of worry over such a long period of time. But it's important not to just deny them, as Paul is saying. That's the only thing I was going to add there. Um, I've had a couple of folks in my clinical practice, and I I basically said. 30 minute television a day, that's it. Where you gonna, where are you gonna watch it? Because you just it's not gonna work. So thanks. That's all I was gonna add there. Let's uh Great. go ahead. Ah, so stay this is really important. Um, you know, I tried to explain to people that when we're dealing with emotional issues and you know, um we, we wanted to offer this as an opportunity to keep people involved but it's also i think part of our mental health initiative uh to really address issues related to mood disorders and so on is it's so easy to find yourself falling into this by staying you know when i talk about depression for example um with the folks i see i'm usually saying it's generally bad feelings about something that happened in the past so regrets, it's issues of loss, it's something that's happened to you. Anxiety disorders usually are the exact opposite. It's focusing too much on something that is yet to happen, stressing about a test that you're gonna have to take, or a, uh, a review at work that's gonna come up, or a presentation for an FJMC webinar. <laughs> it could be any of those things. By staying focused in the moment, we're able to keep a lot of those emotions in check. And, you know, by staying in the present, that is the one area where we do have control. What happened has already happened. What's gonna to be tomorrow, we don't know for sure. <clears throat> we hope we have a good idea, but we don't know for sure. What we control is what we're doing right now. Every one of you made the choice in this moment to be part of this webinar, because you knew on some level this was going to speak to you and hopefully you are gonna have something to contribute, something you're going to learn. And when you do that, again, you're gaining a little bit, a modicum of control over your life and your emotions. So trying to stay focused on the present as much as possible. We talk about mindfulness and you know focusing on where you're at, and especially when people start to get very stressed. It's a good time to take just a time out. I'm big on deep breathing, all of us are really big on that. But you can do something as simple as, you know, and we can all do this in this very moment. So I want you to think for just a moment about your position where you're seated. And to feel where your body is touching a chair or a couch or whatever you may be on. And feel the pressure points. Right now I feel it in my elbows. I feel my feet pressing against the ground. I feel my pressure, you know, a little pressure against my seat and a very light touch against my back. When I really focus on that, it almost becomes meditative. Another thing that we encourage are things like yoga, which is also very mindful, focused on breathing. When we talk about deep breathing, this tends to be one of the most effective ways of staying in the moment and relaxing. And when we do that, we're talking about using our diaphragm, breathing from our belly 
the way I try to encourage people to do this is to think of your stomach as a balloon. And when you inhale, you're inflating the balloon. When you exhale, you're letting that balloon deflate, go down. Most of us are chest breathers. I don't know if I can tilt this down. Um, most of us are chest breathers. When we breathe, we kind of do something like this and watch my hands. Shoulders go up and down, hands go up and down. When we're doing diaphragmatic breathing, you'll see this stage rock steady. It's only this that moves. And I'll, I'll exaggerate a little bit to make the point. When we do that, it does a couple of things. Number one, Gary was talking about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. You're usually stimulating one or the other. You can't do both at the same time. You can't be simultaneously stressed and relaxed. When we breathe from the diaphragm, that stimulates the parasympathetic system. We call that rest and digest, just as the sympathetic is fight or flight. So by doing that simply, you can short circuit whatever emotional issues you might be having, whether it's feelings of depression or anxiety, and getting into the moment. When you do that also, you, you know, when we breathe from our chest, we take in about a cup of air. We breathe from the diaphragm, we take in about a liter of air. And that means much more oxygen that's going to the brain and telling the brain, hey, everything is okay, we're gonna be all right. So that's usually very nice. Um, I did this presentation, or most of this presentation last week for one of my patient groups, and I completely forgot something, so I had to add it, uh, which is spending time with pets. And I mentioned already, I've been taking my dog out for walks on a regular basis. If you do have pets, they're a wonderful source of stress relief, and you cannot help but be in the moment when your cat is snuggling up to you, or your dog is, you know, licking you, or you're, you know, you're going out for that walk, or you're feeding your fish and you're paying attention to them. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to stay very much in the moment. Glad I remembered to add that this time. Gary, what do you want to say? I said two things. Um, you can do mindfulness, not just sitting. Um, I take my dogs for a walk this morning. We'll get to dogs in a minute. And um, I do a mindful walk. I listen for the birds that I can hear. I focus on each bird and where the bird is and what look and all I'm and it's it's hard not to be meditative in that area. Uh, Judaism is big on mindful eating, right? We we have special prayers for the type of food we're going to eat and 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 so there's there's a link between what you can eat and there's actually so you can Google this after our talk. Like there's a raisin exercise you can focus on raisin and looking at a raisin be mindfully looking at the raisin and how you eat the raisin what the raisin tastes like being so focused is a great meditative experience big fan of meditation um the four-legged prozac um because <laughs> that's exactly how they function you can't be stressed or angry or upset or depressed when there's this, these these furry little eyeballs looking at you um all the time so yeah great and always accepting you and always loving you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> exercise, another great way to cope. Um, I think, Paul, you've talked about this a little bit more. If you want to add anything else to here, to this slide, yes. I'll just add the, the last bullet point at the bottom. Just, I mean, there are many different ways to stay active. And a lot of times people say, well, I can't get to the gym. It's like, you don't need to go to the gym. There's so many things you can do at home. And you know, from simple stretching to armchair exercise, I have a lot of people who have knee problems and back problems, and for them, it's really difficult to do standing exercises. But they can do armchair exercises, and for all these things, I've got to tell you, there are tons of resources out there on the internet, on YouTube. For those, you know, most people have cable; you can find these on demand as well. Um, I strongly encourage the use of light weights. Um, light hand weights, for example, or, or resistance bands. And the best time I tell people to do this is while you're already engaged in something else. So for individuals who are watching TV, maybe in the evening, you can be using light weights or resistance bands while you're watching without any problem. People who like to jog, you can jog in place. Yoga, I already mentioned, tons of exercise videos. And uh, you were gonna mention about this last point, last point, Gare? 
I was going to say is, I, I know that my wife and I belong to a gym out here in Southern California, and they are now broadcasting on um, Facebook and Instagram um, internet-based exercise schedules. Um, so that's something else. If you belong to a gym, see if I know Gold's in SoCal is doing that. I would mention that you look at that um, if they're available for your your groups as well. One uh, one other thing I just want to mention about exercise or any of these things, but especially with exercise, it's wonderful to delegate others to help you with this. If you delegate a part of the action, you're much more likely to complete it. So when it comes to walking, I, I like to walk a lot. Um, my wife doesn't like to walk as much, so I can't delegate her to, to help me do that. But what I delegate, believe it or not, is just my phone, because I have an app called Pacer on my phone, which tracks my steps, and I monitor that every single day. And that helps keep me you know, focused on, oh, I gotta get more steps in, I gotta get more steps in. If I can get somebody else in the family to walk with me, it's much more enjoyable. Yesterday, um, friends of ours and my wife and the dog and I, we all went up for a long walk and uh, through uh, some trails that are uh, in our town. And it's like, everybody had a blast. A little fresh air is a great thing right now, especially, you know, unless you are in total lockdown mode. Um, if you have a stay in place kind of order, you can get out and walk, keeping a safe social distance. But, uh, you know, getting other people to engage in that with you, if there's somebody at home who will, you know, push you, encourage you to do some of the light weights, and you encourage them, maybe a spouse or a child or, you know, somebody like that. Or you can also use the internet again to get in touch with others who might be supportive and encouraging. And if you can do it at the same time, it's more likely to get done. That's a great segue to our next slide. Stay connected. Yeah. This is what we're doing, folks. <laughs> Use the phone. Use Skype, although somebody told me I shouldn't talk about Skype anymore. I should just talk about FaceTime and things like that. But in our generation, Skype still works. WhatsApp works really well. I have a brother who is in South Korea, who's a rabbi there in the Air Force. And the way we get to stay in touch is through uh, WhatsApp. Using social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, Online games are a wonderful thing. You know, we are starting to do an online game night and you know, in our family, we're doing it at least once or twice a week now. And we connect, again, we connect, I, you know, with my son in DC, my niece in Cambridge, my brother in South Korea. We're here in Sharon, Massachusetts, my brother and other niece in Newton. So we can have five locales going at once and play and see each other, which is a great thing. So many online groups are taking place uh, right now. So you don't have to look very far to find them. FJMC is making these kind of opportunities available to everybody. Virtual religious services in Indianium. So um, for the last two Shabbatot, I have attended online services at probably 10 different shoals, um, even connecting with Eitz Chaim, Gary's shoal, um, to try to see what the heck was going on there. Our local ones, New York, Chicago, Norwin, you'd appreciate this. Uh, I went to oh, whichever one it was, the Steve Stores in Northbrook and where Alberto Mizrahi is in Chicago. Um, it's a phenomenal, in the Park, you know, Park Avenue Shoal and the Central Synagogue in New York. I mean, this is an amazing way to enjoy services. And I'll tell you, the Rabbinical Assembly has made Cedar Rim available for everybody free online so that uh, that's not a problem. FGMC, of course, you know, International Kiddush Club is putting stuff together. These webinar, webinars and so on all give you opportunities to stay connected. And that's why we encourage the Zoom type meeting because you get to see others as well as, as in addition to just hearing them. So, Gary, what else you want to add? One thing I was going to add is um, at the FG, I think Al Budman and some other folks are putting together a list of synagogues where our services are, are, are being held um, online. Um, I don't know what the status of that spreadsheet is. No, it's a Google Docs. So I think either, I, I think, uh, actually think um, he was on the phone, Mark Ivers was on the call a bit earlier. I think he was also organizing that Google Sheet. So take a look yeah. at that. I submitted about 20 to them and suggested we should be doing that. I think somebody was working on that as well. So yeah, there's amazing opportunities. And if you're sure and doing it already, it's a wonderful opportunity to encourage your show to get engaged because 
one of the things that we're doing is we just started now, but we're trying to encourage uh, our ritual committee to continue this afterwards because we have individuals who might be snowbirds, who might be down in say Florida in the winter and might otherwise not have an opportunity to participate or somebody who's homesick. Um, this is a, a great thing that's offered the community and the RA had said, we have their blessing to go ahead and do it. Great. Steve Mendel, you look like you wanted to say something. Do, do you want to, did you have a question or a comment? I have a couple of comments. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Sure. So a couple of things. So my patients are concerned about their comorbid medical conditions under these circumstances. They're developing um, functional symptoms. Uh, but at the same time, they're unaware whether their hypertension and other medical issues may be exacerbated. And they shouldn't really hesitate to call their physicians. So that's number one. Uh, the second is um, in regards to all these uh, apps and the exercise program, um, I believe that Calm, um, as well as Headspace, um, especially Calm is offering, I believe, one month free trial. Um, so that's very helpful. People going to sleep at night um, or during the day, um, various uh, options are available. The next is, um, the real question is, which both of you can answer, is when does someone call a professional? At what point, other than following um, your presentation, is a professional needed? And is the, and, is the clergy someone they could turn to who would then provide them with resources? That's a great question, Steve. In terms, and, and I, you know, I, I had that in my head as the third thing I was going to add, Paul, to the slide deck, but I did not. So um, I'll, I'll jump in first with with the you know when this becomes something to to bring to a professional's attention. The the, the bar that I hold is that. If this is interfering with your ability to function, to work, you know, Freud said to work and play, right? If you cannot get joy out of things that bring you joy and you cannot function in your work from home setting, then it's probably worth a phone call to someone like a psychologist or a therapist or a, or a counselor um, just to talk it through. And they can do a more in-depth assessment on the phone and say, yeah, let's schedule some individual time to get together. Uh, or let's get your referral to your primary care physician and look at some medication routes uh, along those lines. That, that's, that's the first answer that I'll give. I don't know if you want to add to that, Paul, then we'll get to clergy next. Yeah, no, I would agree. Also, I just want to mention, Steve, you mentioned Headspace, which is a wonderful program. And if you are a mental health provider in the, in the nation, they're giving you a year free. They're, that's something they're offering the community, which is an amazing thing. So if you're a provider, um, you can actually try Headspace for a year for free. I completely agree with what Gary said. In terms of drawing the line, it, again, it's completely normal to have feelings of stress, anxiety, maybe some depression around this. But when it starts to interfere with your life, with your functional capacity in some way, you know, it's, it's, it becomes really difficult for you to go to school online, or you're seeing your relationships really suffer, or you see situations in which you can't get your work done or you're not able to cope or get out of bed or something like that, then we know we've crossed the line in which we have functional uh, issues that make it you know, something in which a professional really should get involved. The great news is that since almost everybody's doing things virtually, you don't even have to leave your home anymore to get these things taken care of. Um, so, and I'll, let, I'll go back to you, Gary, you can say about uh, our uh, clergy. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, clergy is certainly a reasonable place for folks to start as well. Um, my experience with most, with most clergy, um, both, both rabbis and, and, Chaz, and, Chaz, and Chazan, is uh, that they are aware of where they can help, and they also are generally very well connected with resources in the community and the mental health uh, uh, area. Um, so um, I, I, I've had nothing but positive connections with, with multiple clergy in the Southern California area. Um, and I think that for folks that are more comfortable starting with the, with the rabbi or even talking to the rabbi or their chazan, that's, I think that's a reasonable place to start. The key thing is, is as we have up on the slide here, is, is, is that connection. Uh, what's, what's, what's interesting and, and also sort of frustrating I share with my students is that when you look at the research in um, success in psychotherapy, right, what predicts a positive outcome in psychotherapy, doesn't matter where you get your degree, doesn't matter what kind of degree you have, 
doesn't matter what kind of therapy you do, none of that really has any solid predictive uh, power broadly defined. What, what, what is the best predictor of success psychotherapeutically is the quality of the relationship between the therapist and the client, right? So if you go to your, if you go to your rabbi and your rabbi is, is uh, if he or she can have a good connection with you and you can talk it through, and I mean this in all honesty, gigs and go in good health, do that, gig is a day. Steve, you had another, you're, another you're question. Not. So in addition to, um, many of us having living wills, durable power of attorneys, a number of clergy have um, unofficially uh, done things like um, a psychiatric advance directive, not necessarily um, um, to, of a legal nature, but informing the clergy. And clergy are then aware of those people or families that may have mental health issues, and the clergy then reaches out to those families at the time of um, potential crisis or just checks in with them, which, um, which is um, extremely positive because um, sometimes it really um, uh, prevents um, something getting out of control, just hearing right. someone and knowing that the clergy are available. So that's something later on we could talk about and what your experience is with this psychiatric um, advanced directive, uh, not necessarily as a directive, but in fact informing some of the clergy in a confidential way that there are mental health issues within the congregation. Yeah, I tend to view those things more as anticipatory guidance. <laughs> I don't know, Paul, if you want to I was just, just going to add one, a, a couple of really quick things. So first of all, do you know who came up with the data about therapeutic relationship being the most uh, important factor? It was um, Neil, Paul Neil. Alan Bergen, my oh, advisor. Oh, you guys, that, that's right. <laughs> and and um, bring him, uh, bring him BYU. BYU. Yeah, actually, he yeah. was a coordinate. He was a he was at Columbia at the time he did that research, but he you, found that, right. so yeah. Right. So yeah, that's what I'm steeped in, research. outcome research and taking a look at why things work. So I think based on that and, you know, commenting about what you were saying, Stephen, sure. You know, if you, you know, clergy are people you trust and go to, by all means do it. They've been trained to do some counseling and to know how to handle things. As Gary said, they tend to have a pretty good Rolodex, uh, maybe not a Rolodex anymore, but you know what I mean. But by if there's somebody else who you think you you know you have a relationship, it, it can be pri your primary care doc, you know it can be somebody else who's in your sphere that you trust. You know go reach out to them. Um, last, I think this is one. Of, no, maybe the last yeah. one. Maybe it's one of the last ones. So this notion of being productive, get things done. So I was like, I think the way I'd cast this is this is a very unique opportunity for many of us. You know, I am never home this much, ever. You know, I'm always at work. And it's like, if you look at this time as this, you know, maybe for some of us, once in a, a rare blue moon lifetime to be home and to get stuff done, there's so many things we can try to achieve. And again, it's, it's how you focus and think about it on more positive levels. So I have a couple of books that I'm planning to read that I wouldn't have read otherwise because you know what? I no longer have a two to three hour commute each day. This is found time. And so I want to use that well, you know, paying bills, taking care of getting caught up on that. So binge watching, you know, I have thoroughly enjoyed binge watching a few shows. I have gone for uh, Designated Survivor and Madam Secretary, two political dramas in which there are really good people in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying that thoroughly. <laughs> cleaning up the house. We're using this as an as early spring cleaning opportunity to get, you know, we're getting ready for Pesach, of course, but I have more time than ever to go through and clean spaces up, organizing things, saying, you know, this is a wonderful time to plan things for the future. We actually were supposed to be um, on vacation right now. It's supposed to be a conference in Florida, and my wife and I, I, I I was like, we haven't taken a real vacation for a long time. So this week, as of last night, we were supposed to be on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. Um, and of course, everything got canceled. So no vacation. And I was like, 
I was going to just go do my work instead. I was like, you know what? I've got too many other things to get done. So I'm taking this as a, a homestay work vacation in which I have some writing I need to get done, a few projects. So taking care of that, I never would have had this opportunity otherwise. Online education is everywhere right now. Goal, you know, I say try to pick up a new skill. So brushing up on language, something related to music. This is a good time to do some finance stuff, folks. You know, the markets have tanked and risen and tanked and risen. We've got this volatility. So now's a wonderful time to get a little bit of, you know, financial education. Torah, Talmud, Peer KFO study groups, there are study groups everywhere out there now. FJMC has done this locally, regionally. There are tons of educational opportunities that you might never have been able to take advantage of. In doing some of my research and taking a look at shows that were live streaming their services, I also found tons of shows who are having online live stream classes covering all these areas, and they are free. And, you know, we should think of this as a beautiful opportunity. Again, it's how you cast it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to get a lot of other things done that we would not have done otherwise. Gary. You got it. I mean, I, we, I was involved with a peer care vote study group that we met Saturday mornings before shul. We moved it all online and we now meet on Sunday mornings. And um, it, it's, if you, so that's something else. If you've been a part of a group in the real world for a while, it's very easy to zoom to move it into the, the virtual world and, and keep that uh, personal distance. And we should put in a quick plug, because Tuesday night, for the very first time ever, we're going to be doing a virtual Hearing Men's Voices, or, you know, what I call Hearing Men Virtually, that kind of HMV. So, <laughs> and it's going to be focused on coronavirus to give people a real chance to talk about their experiences. We've never done it before. Heck, why not give that a try? A unique opportunity, absolutely. So, Steve's got his hand up again. So, I saw the uh, finger. Just to um, reiterate what you said, last night on I-24 News, there was a rabbi who used the word reflection. And the word was reflection. What can I accomplish at this period of time that I have not accomplished in the past? And how I look back upon this as an opportunity to get something done that otherwise I never would have thought to be done. And look at it as something to be positive. And the other is, Gary, there's a wonderful presentation. I wonder whether um, um, if you can put it out there for um, either the Hashofer or put it out there on um, the mental health newsletter, our health and wellness, and we could distribute this even with some sentences to support our members that are going out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Should be able to. So if you contact Richard Gray. Um, yep. He'll just you let him know that um, it should be the next portion, um, and whether he has anything with uh, economics or retirement, they could put this out as a special issue or however you want, but it'll go out there and permanently to all the members with a wide distribution. This would be very helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Um, this is our, our last slide. So... Um, be safe. You know, Paul was talking before about things you can control, things you can't control. These are things you can do. Uh, and these, most of these things are, are, are common sense. You want to wash your hands. Like there was a great website out there where you could type in like your favorite song and it would do the 12 different steps that are 20 seconds long to that particular song. I have um, Bruce Springsteen's um, Mad Men's drummer, blinded by the light on my window in my, my clinical office that, that with you know, a little humor to lighten the load. Um, I love, Paul, I love what you said in terms of personal distancing as opposed to social distancing, because we are all very connected right now, right? Even though we're more than six feet away. Um, don't take unnecessary risks. We, um, my wife and I um, have been uh, sharing dinner with, with another family that has not gone out anywhere else. We've sort of been socially isolating together. Their son came home from college from, co from Connecticut this morning. We're not gonna see them for another two weeks. And they, they're okay, we're okay with that. And that's just a smart thing to do. I don't know his, if his son is infected, just don't take unnecessary risks. Shopping trips, I, 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 my wife sent me this great video that I thought was um, 
rather rational and, and reasoned. Um, among many things this, this gentleman was saying was you should plan your shopping trips two weeks apart. Right? Don't be going to the market every day because you're just increasing your risk of exposure. Uh, and this is something we're doing right now. Actually, I'm going to skip that next one and go to the next one. Be careful of alcohol intake. Um, people can use it as a, as a very not maladaptive um, coping strategy. Um, we also know that cigarette smoking puts you at a much higher risk for further complications with COVID. So if you smoke, now's a great time to stop. Uh, and there are lots of resources uh, to help you with that as well. And of course, supporting others remotely, which is going back up, is, is what we're doing now. And I think, Stephen, you were talking about that, that proactive reaching out to folks. Um, there, are, there are folks in my, in my peer pay vote group that I'll periodically text just to see how they're doing. Um, it's just a good thing to do. It helps you connect with other folks. Paul, think anything you want to add? No, I think that's it. You, you can be safe without sacrificing, uh, you know, a lot too. Uh, we talk about supporting each other remotely and, you know, being careful with alcohol intake. It's interesting. My son, who's, you know, in his 20s, has virtual happy hours with his friends. They may have 20 guys together who have a drink once a week, and they sit around and chat. They're doing Sunday brunch now, remotely. Um, you know, there are ways to be safe and communicate. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's a wise idea if you're able to get outside, get some fresh air. There's no reason to not be around your home area. Unless, you know, I, I was talking, we have a, a, a boy who we took in in high school from China. And he lives in downtown Chicago, and he, it's a very congested area. It's difficult for him to get out quite as much. However, um, you know, we, we do encourage getting out, getting fresh air as long as possible. And, uh, you know, just, you know, I, 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 I found the graphic. I thought that was really funny. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Coffee comes first. But, you know, take care of your needs. Be safe. And we're, we're all going to get through this together. Let's see, I just, Dalla and Jacobs, technology is a good thing. They keep saying we need social design, I disagree. Physical distancing needs to keep, yeah, absolutely. That's what we're talking about. No need, it's a, it's a misnomer. We don't want to talk about social distance at all. We want social connection, personal space. That's all we care about. Thank you, Alan, for mentioning that again. Steven's got his hand up. Um, all right, and that that we've done. the last slide up, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go for discussion. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we've done today is I've called many people, some of whom I hadn't spoken to in a long time. I know they may be alone or they just may be a couple and inviting them, if I know how to do it with your directions, how to set up a Zoom Seder. And now inviting these people who you may not have been uh, in touch with so that people shouldn't be alone. And this is a fabulous time if we are all going to learn how to do this, to have people invite them to your Seder. It'll give them something to look forward to for the next 10 days. Um, and it's something that makes us feel much better. Yeah, yeah. We did a virtual Shabbat dinner last Friday night. Um, very similar to what Paul was saying in terms of family game nights. We had family from California to North Carolina, Chicago, Denver, all. We did, we did the candle lighting. We did the blessing, the hamotzi, the kiddush. And then everyone went off to eat on their own. Um, and it was lovely. We, I did a surprise birthday party for my son last night on Zoom. His girlfriend actually it was her idea, uh, but I sent out the invitations and we had 45 people on wow. the Zoom call. Yeah, it was, it was impressive. Crazy. My wife was tearing up. She said, I can't believe you knows all these people. Uh, but it was lovely. It was really lovely. And that's ways in which we can connect. Steve, your point about not being comfortable with starting Zoom. Um, I, I notice that Al's um, out of the picture now, but I think one thing that we might want to add to our Zoom webinars or our webinars in general is maybe have like open office hours to help folks use Zoom. Um, I did that with my mom the week before our Shabbat dinner. Um, I FaceTimed her. I said, okay, put your camera on here. Now click here, click here, click here. Now when you get my invitation, all you have to do is click the Zoom link and you're done. That's all I have to do. That's it. Right, but it's a little bit more difficult to schedule the Zoom meeting. You're right, Steve, and maybe we could do a better job at FJMC of, of teaching folks how to do that. So that would be a really good thing to do. But this is part of the positive that can come out of all this. We're finding new ways 
to use technology to connect in a way that we never really have. You know, we've talked about this from F with FGMC for a while, but we really hadn't put it into true practice. Now we're actually doing that. Um, I, I will tell you, if you want to do a Zoom Seder, there's no reason not to. Um, I, for anybody who wants to get a free Zoom account, they can, but they're limited to 40 minutes and they can have about 100 people join in. If you pay 15 bucks a month, I think it's, it's unlimited time. So if you want to do a Seder, spring for the 15 bucks for the month, because otherwise everybody's going to get shut up. There are other services that do this as well. Go to meeting is one. Uh, freeconferencecall.com is another one. I think free conference call is actually free and I think it's unlimited time. So there are a number of these resources and I, I second what you're saying, Gary, that we should really look at, you know, helping people do the how-to. I can promise you if you go to YouTube, you're going to find tons of how to set these things up. But the notion of having open office hours, yeah. you know, the few people who are technologically savvy, would be a wonderful, wonderful thing so you could ask, you know, questions and get answers. I love that thought. Al, I, I don't know if you heard that comment that, that Paul and I were talking about a few moments ago. We might want to add to the FJMC webinar list uh, maybe some times and a phone number that someone could either FaceTime people who want to learn how to start Zoom sessions. Um, sort of like open office hours from how to do Zoom. I, I'm happy to do that. I do that with my mom. I think part of the problem we're facing. Yeah, we, go ahead. Al Kan did that when he was talking about how to do a, uh, a, a stater on Zoom. Great. And, and he's reporting, repeating that this week. Go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. All right. Other questions or comments? Any feedback? How was tonight? Are you feeling less anxious, more anxious, same anxious? <laughs> Very calm. Very calm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great job, guys. Gary, could you turn off the screen share so we can all see bigger pictures of one another? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good idea. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. That's better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Joel. Hey, Brayden's there too. Good to see you guys. All right. Thank you. See you. Crane, where are you guys. hiding? He's hiding. I'll show I yourself. Question, I have a question for what I do to reduce my stress. <laughs> walk. walk. Listen to a book and walk. Ah. Yeah, great. And you can just, just walk. don't walk into things. There's great tone. And look at we'll some in the grocery store. All right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great technique, though. Great. Well, if you're wondering which aisle I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> I'm going to turn off the recording now. <laughs> now you're on, yes. Now you've been recorded. Very true. Very true. Makes sense. All right. Um, Other people have thoughts that you found have particularly been working well for you during this time to help you with the coping? I'm, I'm having, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm across the room. Sure. We hear you fine. I work in home health. I have to go out every day into strangers' homes. And I am having a really hard time. Still recording. Um, I do have equipment. I do have masks. I do have gloves. But I also am going into homes where I don't know where I'm walk what I'm walking into. Many of them have large extended families crammed into one home who um, either have no concept of what distancing is or can't control themselves. And it's a terrifying situation I'm walking into daily at this point. Um, and much of what I do requires that I be very close. I have a specialist in swallowing disorders. For, and that's probably 20% of my caseload. And it's really scary to be out there right now. I, I find myself wishing I could wake up with the flu so I could call in sick. Okay, hmm. I, I mean, other than offering some guidelines, your, your profession probably has already done. You, I mean, I would recommend that you see folks uh, if you're walking to someone's room, just be in w one room with that one person, uh, that if at all possible. That doesn't happen in, in somebody's house. Yeah, I'd imagine. If you see what some of these houses look like. I, I can only uh, imagine. There, you know, there, there are the, the small number of ideal homes, but that's a small number. I'm walking into houses where there are, you know, probably 30% uh, are hoarders. 
There are people crammed into little tiny rooms and you could break a leg just trying to get near the patient. It's, it's a, a, a really, really dangerous situation and it's very scary. Maybe uh, it's it's a, uh, can I just ask, is there, oh, go, on, go ahead, Joel. Maybe if it's not an emergency situation, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. I mean, I'm not doing, I'm not doing any, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist and we cancel, we don't do any elective procedures now. You know, I, I do, we're only dealing of, with emergency. None of what I am sent out to do is elective and most of my patients, it are, it is, you know, I don't get to choose what gets sent to me and what doesn't. Uh, is, there, is there any chance for you to do any of this outdoors? you know, just outside their home at a porch or something like that, even in a hallway, would be much safer than being cramped into these small spaces. Occasionally, but I, I am a therapist. Many of these patients are, the, the whole reason they're seen in the home is because they're immobile. So we can't move them from where they are. Yeah. So this is a tough situation. That's, that's tough. It's really scary. And I just... Uh, my, uh, what's holding me up is I work four days a week and then I already had a scheduled week off week after next. So I keep saying, okay, one more day, one more day, one more day, and then I'm off for a week. That's not a bad coping strategy, right? <laughs> Seeing it as, as a, a limited time frame, uh, yes. you know, we, we call that chunking, right? Just, I'm going to look at just this next couple of days and see what goes through. That. But uh, I, that's tough. I've got a, uh, my cousin's wife is a, ER nurse, and oh. she's um, she's feisty and she's uh, determined, but she's also very nervous. She's uh, they have a, a young daughter. I think Eva is I think two or three now, and they've got a thirteen year, fourteen year old, and it's uh, it's tough, tough. Yeah. So hopefully you're doing a ton of hand washing after you see these people as well. Get undressed in the garage. All chapped? <laughs> yep, get undressed. We all got the same hands right now. Yeah. yeah. When you get home, have Alex moisturize you. Give her a little hand massage, Alex. <laughs> there you go. I don't know if that's in Alex's job description, but I'm sure he's up to it. I think Ketuba. you're right, Alex. <laughs> it's in the Ketuba. It's in the Ketuba. <laughs> What are other issues people are facing or things you've done that have helped you? It's good to see Steve Silverstone on as well. How are you, Steve? I, I, I don't know if this is the right, but listen, my, my temple has done a really good job of making things available online where we can participate in services and Havdalah and even a daily minion. And I really appreciate that because I'm in my house by myself and I feel isolated, but those few moments a day are a blessing to me because I feel like I can connect with my community. So I really appreciate it. I agree, Alan, I agree. I'll tell you- and I, would, I was just gonna say, I would encourage any of you who don't have that opportunity right now to be speaking to your leaders because this is something that they really can and should be doing. We really, you know, we've pretty much shut down services uh, and the show, but doing one, many more of these online opportunities is exactly the way we're, we're trying to go. And uh, we had to encourage our rabbi a little bit. You know, he didn't leap to it initially. So, um, you know, it, with a little bit of subtle encouragement, you can do that. And again, Alan, you know, I would encourage you to explore the whole world of these opportunities. And because, where, where do you live, Alan? He's in the valley, out here. Valley, okay. So one of the things you think about too, and which I find really fascinating, is the opportunity to take advantage of the different time zones. So, you know, I, there are things that are happening much earlier, you know, in the east or in the Midwest or the Rocky Mountain area that are happening on the West Coast if you're an early riser, for example. Uh, or if you stay up late and you're on the East Coast, you can take advantage right. of what's going on in the West. I, Don't limit yourself to your own congregation. There are opportunities literally throughout the nation. You're, you're correct. And there's been several other things through Ramah and various other things, and I have dialed into them. But, I, 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 of course, I feel a personal connection to my, my synagogue and my community. So I'm really appreciative that they're doing what they're doing. Absolutely. And Although I, I will tell you on Shabbos, um, I, I, I was listening to Pesuke de Zimra 
Well, I wasn't loving it. We're at the one I was at, so I caught it an hour later. <laughs> With Ms. Rocky, and that was really fun. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's great. We've, That's enjoyed, good. we've enjoyed being able to, uh, through the virtual presentations, to enjoy our our daughter, who's now a rabbi in Indianapolis. To uh, cool get to see her do some of her stuff. That's nice. That's awesome. In the confines of her home, but you know. Yeah. That's great. What about others? Things that you found have been very helpful to you during these weeks. I want to share a quick story. Alan was was talking before about this notion of being isolated and being alone and and really needing that connection. I think this, you know, we're social beings. I had a um, a student. He was a graduate student on Monday last Monday that told me he says we're social beings and now we're forced to interact on these these particular you know two dimensional screens and it's really tough. Um, there's a, a, a very beloved friend of mine who's in my peer pay of Vogue group. He happens to be a retired surgeon. And um, he was helping in surgery, I think, a week and a half ago. And, and Joel, you might, you would probably know this, this protocol better than I. But at the end of the surgery, and everything, you know, everything's all you know, patched up and the patient's getting ready to go. Everyone sort of says, thank you, and shakes hands. You know, thanks to the chart, to the nurse, and these whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so my buddy was assisting the surgeon, and he sh reaches across the bed to shake this main surgeon's hand, and he's living by himself now, and he shakes his hand, and he claps his hand together, and he said, can we just do this for just a little bit longer, right? Because they're all gowned, right? Gloves, gown, everything. And he said, I haven't had that physical contact in days. And that's it's, what, what, what Alan was talking about, of being isolated is is really a very poignant thing, uh, and I think this talk about what Paul was saying before about really appreciating things. This is a golden opportunity to remember and to cherish the, the physical contact and the, and the and the emotional and psychological contact we have with each other as well. Although I think doing all this stuff online and this it's making me understand what it's like to be a millennial every day. <laughs> this is their life. <laughs> you look at early, earlier today. I had a, a Zoom session with both my daughters. One lives in Atlanta. One lives in, in yep. Thousand Oaks, not far from Gary. And uh -huh. uh, they got their kids on and stuff. It, it's really nice to do things like that. Yeah, and yeah. that's what? something you could do, Alan, with your kids. One of the things that my, my other daughter, who's um, at the American Jewish University and doing all of her classes online and, and online. teaching online, um, is that she's suffering Zoom fatigue. That this so much of this kind of communication is, is, is artificial compared to face to face, and it takes more attention and more energy that really using Zoom in excess can be can become a, a a barrier absolutely so day one of northridge going fully online monday teaching schedule i start at 9 30 in the morning and i finish at seven o'clock at night i was on zoom and then in the middle i had an fj and z meeting i think somewhat somewhere in there as well so i was on zoom almost for like close to 12 14 hours straight i come downstairs i sit on the couch next to my office no more Zoom. No more Zoom. No more Zoom. <laughs> Just put something else on the top. No, no more Zoom. So I, I'm very acutely aware of that as well. It's tough. For all of its benefits, it is. It has some costs. Any other contributions, comments, thoughts? Outstanding program. Thank you, Norwin. Thank you very Excellent much. Excellent job, Norwin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you nice guys. to see you all. It is to, a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Paul, thank you so much for your collaboration. This was Good wonderful. Dr. Gary, love working with you, buddy. Love it's it. always the best. It's always every great. opportunity it, I can. This was a good experience. Thank you. Very I appreciate much. you taking the time to do this. Thank you very, very much. Al, Our thank pleasure. you for facilitating. Thanks, guys. And there are many, many more of these to come. FJMC has yes. a full so we'll schedule of these Zoom webinars coming. 
Alan Budman, do you want to comment about that? Yes, thank you again, guys. You did a great job. Uh, if you want to present on something, anything, it does not have to be Jewish related, it doesn't have to be anything related. It can be related to literally nothing. So you could do Seinfeld if you want, for example. Uh, write to me at A Budman, A B U D M A N, at fjmc.org. A Budman, <coughs> pardon me, at fjmc.org. Happy to have you. Thanks very much. Thank, I'm going to thank, thank you. Say good night to everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Right. Good night, everybody. Be well. Stay safe. And uh, have a chug. Pesach Sameach. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right.